for the morning session of BYOB. So we'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this BYOB is um, a reprise, I guess, we were calling it, of last year's Tuesday night BYOB. So I, I know some of you may have dropped in for a session or two of that. And we actually started this we had one session, right, yep. Rachel? Yeah, I think, I think some of you were there for that session, and then the pandemic hit. So I'm just going to throw open the floor, and you guys can tell me what I told you last session. <laughs> you had a paper. Well, yeah, it sounds about right, because the first session was always like a couple verses. I mean, it was really this <laughs> slow crawl through. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, but so the evening one actually, it, it's kind of funny, we, we went through kind of the whole Bible, just at a very high level, bird's eye view, roughly. And this will be a little bit more of a microscopic thing, although we will find ourselves many times not in the Gospel of Mark, because Mark is so um, enriched by knowledge of the Old Testament. So we'll see, hopefully, very quickly, even in the first four verses, that Mark is very much influenced by the Old Testament. And even though he is one of the gospel writers who doesn't cite the Old Testament explicitly many times, he is very much imbued with um, just the images of the Old Testament, the stories of the Old Testament. And he is making them present to us in a new way to try to describe this new thing. So if you think about what the good news is. What is the good news? What is it? But what is the gospel? The writings of four inspired men. Sort of, yeah. The writings of four inspired men, but it's, it's more than that. What, like, what is the, es- the essence of the gospel? The story of, salvation. the story of salvation, but one event in particular that is... Well, even more than the words of Jesus, what exactly narrows it down to a genre of gospel? The life life and the life, especially after a certain point, when he died. So his resurrection. The resurrection is the definitive good news. The fact that God will not let death be the end. He doesn't let death be victorious. And so when we say the gospel, all of that, in a sense, includes what Jesus said and did, I would say. But as some um, biblical scholars would say, Mark wrote a passion narrative. And everything before that is kind of prologue. Hard to believe. I mean, that's like 13, (laughs) 13 chapters of prologue. But Mark's gospel, you'll notice, is the shortest, which is why we're beginning with it. But it is so dense densely packed with a lot of stuff. And so our purpose here, when we're reading through the Gospel of Mark, even if it's just four verses at a time, it's a purpose of of getting ourselves to learn how to read and learn how to recognize the language in order to understand more deeply, really, the Gospel, which is the fact that this man, Jesus, rose from the dead. It's something that we've never seen before. And it's something, curiously, that every single one of us is invited to. So if we lose that, we lose the core of the gospel. We have another preacher in the first century who's walking around and saying nice things. But what's different about Jesus is that he completely took on sin. And we'll see that with his baptism. He completely took it on and redeemed it by rising from the dead and showing just what the power of God really is. So I would ask, actually, almost every session of this evening, um, BYOB last year, I would ask, what is the gospel? And we defined it, and then the next session I would ask it again, and no one remembered. So <laughs> it's not really one, one definition, but it has to include really the resurrection or the power of God. Now, Paul, we've been reading through Romans in the liturgy for weeks now. And we're finally getting to the end of Paul. But do you remember how Paul began the Romans? He defines the gospel. Why don't we turn to Romans, which is the first of the letters. 
And if we turn to chapter 1, Paul gives a nice little introduction as he normally does. He greets the people. He gives thanks. But then there's something that should shape our understanding of Paul and, we'll see, of Mark. If we turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Sixteen. We did talk about it on March 12th. Good. <laughs> I'm glad our memory serves. <laughs> so Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is definition. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. For Jew first and then Greek. That one line is something that I would kind of etch into my brain about the gospel. Now, it doesn't say the word resurrection, but what does it say that is synonymous with the resurrection, we'll find out, is power. Power. So God's power is the fact that God is a God of life and is not one that will let death reign. So the power of God manifested supremely in the resurrection is the power that's coming into our lives in the kingdom of God, which will be Jesus' first words in the Gospel of Mark. He says the kingdom of God is at hand, the power of God is at hand, and you'll see it in my works, but you'll see it especially in my resurrection from the dead. So we will constantly go back to this theme that the, the Gospel is the power of God. And what does it say for the salvation of of everyone, of all. We're going to see that in a very special way in Mark's Gospel because we'll see as we read and reread Mark's Gospel, hopefully we'll pick up on things that we didn't the first time, but we'll understand that Mark is very inclusive. And I mean that in an ethnic sense because many people think that the Messiah would come for the Jews, the people of Israel, the chosen people. And Mark is saying, yes, but... He's following his teacher, who is probably Paul. He's very influenced by Paul, which is why we're reading a little bit of Paul right now. He's saying, yes, but Jew first and then Greek, Gentile. So this is not just a one race show. It's not just a one group show. This is for everybody, and it's incumbent upon us, the agents of the gospel, to preach that and live it. So anytime we're excluding... <laughs> one class of people, one group of people, or our enemies even from the power of God, we're not preaching the gospel. So, so the purpose, again, is to read Mark's gospel. It's to read scripture as well, as we're going to dip into other parts of scripture. But what's the purpose of reading scripture? What would you say the purpose of reading scripture really is? Does it exist for its own sake? To reveal Jesus to us and to learn, yeah. To build a better, better relationship. And I, I would say especially we read Scripture, the Word of God, in order to be able to read the world of God. So it's not just about reciting Scripture. Many of the scribes can do that, we'll see. Many of the people who are trained in Scripture might have very little faith that it actually is testifying to the power of God. But the purpose really is to be able to read the world, which means that we discern and we act in the world. So this, this Gospel of Mark, and really the Gospel in general, comes alive in not only how we understand it in front of us, but how we put it into practice, knowing what we know about say, including the Gentiles, or just how strong the power of God is. So why are we beginning with Mark? Well, first of all, I already mentioned that it is the shortest of the Gospels, so it's very manageable. You could probably sit down and read it in one sitting, maybe two. It reads very quickly. And you'll notice that Mark has a favorite word, or maybe you won't notice because it's not always translated. 
But Mark's favorite word, or one of his favorite words, is immediately, immediately. You'll notice that as we go through, Mark is kind of in a hurry. He doesn't have time for details. It, everything is kind of densely packed, and we have to unpack it. Compared to Matthew or Luke, Luke, who is the longest of the Gospels, um, he, Mark is very sparse in his narrative, but there's so much there. and So we have to take time really to um, digest it. There's a lot of baggage, too. So we will enter into some of that baggage and unpack it so that we can understand the Old Testament as well. Mark is also the first gospel that was written. Now, that's confusing to some of us because Matthew comes first in the Bible. But most biblical scholars will say that Mark was actually the first one written, which makes a lot of sense. It's the shortest, it's the least detailed in terms of how it's constructed, literally. literally. It's also foundational. So we look at Matthew's gospel, and Matthew uses almost all of Mark. Almost all of it, 90-some percent of Mark. And he changes some of the things to reflect more of his perspective and his vantage point, his time, his community. But it's important to know that Mark is being used as a foundation, probably by, Mar or by Matthew and Luke. So really understanding Mark already gives us a head up, or a leg up, in understanding Matthew and Luke. And probably John as well. John kind of goes off into his own kind of theological reflection. His language is different. But many biblical scholars actually think that John is really a kind of interpretation of Mark. And so, much like in a homily, you're supposed to interpret the Word of God, but not just read it. You're supposed to bring it into kind of our current milieu, our current environment. John may be doing that with Mark. We don't have sources exactly that tell us that, but this is just kind of thinking, okay? So who is Mark? Does anyone know who Mark is? Any ideas? It's important to realize that this gospel is, in its original form, probably did not have the name Mark attached to it. You'll notice if we read through the gospel, not once does Mark actually appear in Mark's gospel. Um, so the gospel itself didn't necessarily have the name Mark attached to it. It was probably added. The, the oldest copies that we have of, of a gospel with the name on it would be like from the 200s, I think. So, yeah. so the, the gospel itself was probably written around 70 A.D., around the time. What, what happened in 70 A.D.? Do we remember? Something was destroyed. Probably many things were destroyed, but one important thing, the temple was destroyed for the second time because it had been destroyed way back when in the Babylonian exile, when the Babylonians came and set fire to the temple and all that and then dragged some of the elite back home with them. So Mark, who is Mark? Well, we're not going to get any help from the gospel itself except we might glean a kind of perspective on who this writer is but there are instances of Mark in the New Testament. So the letter to Philemon is Paul's letter to Philemon, which is a short letter, um, just one chapter. Verse 24, there's a mention of Mark. There's also a mention of Mark in Colossians and in Timothy. We'll also see in um, the Acts of the Apostles, John Mark. John Mark is one who... Um, turns away from Paul. And Paul's kind of upset. Remember, there's a point in the Acts of the Apostles where they're trying to set off on a, a mission, and Paul and Barnabas have to separate because Barnabas wants Mark to come along, or John Mark to come along, even though he kind of abandoned them earlier. So we'll see, maybe, this is a hypothesis, this is not something set in stone, but we'll see that there's this... Um, this idea in the Gospel of Mark of abandonment, that maybe that's a reason that the name Mark was eventually attached to the Gospel. And Mark, as we'll see, is very much influenced by Paul, 
Paul is writing letters, though. He's writing advice. He's trying to put the gospel into people's lived experiences. And he's doing that before any of these gospel accounts were written. So Mark might be the first one to actually give us um, a gospel narrative. And he's constructing it with a lot of Paul's theology. So that's one of the, one of the reasons we think that Mark may have been attached to the gospel manuscript to say that Mark was a revered name or figure in the early church, but now um, this gospel bears his name. So we don't have any real concrete evidence of who Mark himself was, which is okay because in the ancient world, they didn't really care to put their name on everything. Today, we want to stamp everything with our name down to the very last tweet. We want to make sure everyone knows our opinion well, it was very different back in the day because they were writing for a community. And this was actualizing the gospel for them. So this gospel, the gospel of Mark, was one that didn't just fall from the sky. I think everyone in this room knows that, hopefully. <laughs> it didn't just fall from the sky. It wasn't just dictated you know, by a little birdie. It was a fruit of lived experience. So the first stage of the gospel, we can say, is preaching. When we hear these accounts in the Acts of the Apostles, these people, men and women, were enlightened by the Holy Spirit to understand what they didn't understand before in their encounter with Jesus. So now they could understand it and they preached it. And when they preached it, certain things came together in the church community. They would write some of it down eventually, especially as members of that community were starting to die they didn't think that they were going to die. They thought Jesus would be coming back a little bit more quickly than he was. And so there was kind of this shock. These people are dying, especially some of these older people who knew the very Jesus that we worship. And so they write it down. And after they write down some of these sources, they collect maybe some of the sayings or some of the stories that they remember from Jesus. They're formed into a collection or a narrative like Mark's Gospel. So Mark is really revolutionary in the sense that he's, make, he's, he's writing the first narrative accounts that we have of Jesus' life and most especially his death and resurrection. And everything that comes before is kind of leading up, in a sense, to that. You'll notice that Mark starts where? With John the Baptist in the desert or in the wilderness, probably a better term. Um, Mark starts there, whereas Matthew starts with Joseph and Mary, the genealogy and Joseph and Mary, and Luke gives us the Christmas account with Mary. Mary speaks, Joseph doesn't, um, and the Magnificat and the angels and shepherds and everything that everyone loves on Christmas Eve. Thank God we have that because if we didn't, we'd be reading in the desert. <laughs> that might not make for warm Christmas memories. So, okay, any questions so far? No? Perfectly clear. So this is a new genre, the gospel genre. So what is the gospel? So we already defined it. Let's, let's start reading Mark's gospel. See if we can get through the same four verses. <laughs> so chapter one of Mark's gospel. Is everyone there? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Do you have the Son of God in square brackets? Everyone? Okay, we'll talk about that. As it is written in, the, in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John the Baptist appeared in the desert proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We'll stop there for now. So, what do we notice immediately? <laughs> immediately, one of Mark's favorite words. Hopefully not one of mine. What do we notice from the very beginning of the gospel? Anything jump out to you? He is reaching back to the Old Testament. To Isaiah. And what part of Isaiah? Do you have footnotes at all? 
She wrote it down from last time. Good. Spoil the surprise. Please. Isaiah 15.40? I think it's 40. Um, but, okay, so from the very beginning we encounter a problem that has befuddled, angered, annoyed people who are writing and copying the gospel, the, the manuscript copiers, copyists we call them. Because what follows from as it is written in Isaiah the prophet is a quote, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. Which never once appears in the book of Isaiah. So I guess it was a trick question. <laughs> it was, it, this is not in the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> so, real trustworthy, right? We're reading this gospel and he doesn't even know his Old Testament, but he's claiming to give us the good news. He he doesn't know his Old Testament. Well, that is the opinion of most of the people who are copying this. And so they tried to change it. And they would, they would kind of say, well, he didn't mean Isaiah. So they would say the prophets, as it is written in the prophets. Because it is said in the Old Testament. It's just not said by Isaiah, the prophet. So where is it said? Behold, I am sending my messenger. If we knew what messenger meant. The word is angel, actually. Angelos is messenger. The angel. <laughs> it's one thing that we, we wouldn't know because it's hidden in language, but the Hebrew word for angel is malach, and my angel would be malachi, is that a name of the book of the Bible? The last book in the Old Testament is Malachi, Malachi, which means my messenger. Yeah. <laughs> but these are things that we wouldn't pick up on if, you know, someone didn't teach us. I mean, we have to be kind of led along. And then once you see them, you're thinking, okay, this makes a little bit more sense, I hope. <laughs> I hope. So, behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. Malachi, I think it's chapter 3, uh, verse 1, I think. And, Ma and Isaiah 40. We'll get to Isaiah 40 in just a second. Malachi 3, 1. So, Malachi is the last of the Old Testament. It's the last book. And probably arranged that way because it's speaking of Elijah who is to come. Remember, Mal Malachi says... I will send my messenger. And then eventually it says, I'm sending Elijah back. And that's when you know the day of the Lord is upon you. So, interesting, because as we read on, who do we encounter first in Mark's Gospel? John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is later identified as... As who? Which prophet? John the Baptist. There you go. Elijah. Elijah. So Malachi is talking about Elijah coming. John the Baptist shows up. And John the Baptist, later in the Gospel, Jesus would say, you didn't recognize Elijah when he was here. He's John the Baptist. Don't you see? And this makes sense because Jesus' first words are going to be, what did we say his first words in the Gospel are? In this Gospel? Well, that's the gospel's first words, but Jesus' first words are, this is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so he's saying, basically, the day of the Lord is here. It's here upon us, which is kind of pointing us back to Malachi and, and the prophets who spoke about this at length, that the day of the Lord is coming. You'll recognize it by recognizing Elijah which they don't recognize Elijah. <laughs> they just see it, this crazy guy in the wilderness baptizing. But where did Isaiah come from then? Where did Isaiah come from? Now, Isaiah? Well, where, why is Mark saying, as it is written in, the, in Isaiah the prophet, blah, blah, blah. Well, there is part of that that is from Isaiah. So a voice of one crying out in the desert, 
Let's go to Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40. <laughs> I'll file your complaint with the, the state. <laughs> Are we there? Isaiah 40, chapter 1. Let's r read a little bit. You'll recognize it as this great advent kind of theme. We hear it a lot in Advent. Comfort, give comfort to my people, says our God, says your God. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service has ended, that her guilt is expiated, that she has received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. And then what do we see? A voice proclaims, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. And if you know the Messiah, you know that Handel uses a lot of Isaiah, or at least the libretto uses a lot of Isaiah. And this is like four or five different numbers. They're beautiful. And they're a great way of getting us in the mood for the Gospel of Mark. But a voice is proclaiming, colon, in the wilderness prepare, prepare the way of the Lord. So that's where Mark is citing Isaiah. Now what's going on though in Isaiah is more important than just the fact that he's citing Isaiah. So this is Isaiah 40. Now do you guys have headings? The promise of salvation. And right before that, do you have a bigger heading? The Lord's glory in Israel's liberation. Liberation from what? Exactly. Bondage from the Babylon Babylonians. And so... This, Isaiah 40, is what is being spoken to people in Babylon. Isaiah 1 through 39, for the most part, we think it is what's spoken to the people before they've left for Babylon, trying to get them not <laughs> to have to die in Babylon. Isaiah 40, they've been in Babylon, they've been in exile, their temple has been destroyed. They are in ruins as a people, which is basically death. It's basically death. Why? Because this is a people that was promised a land. They built a temple, which was signifying the presence of God among them. And so what happens when your temple, signifying the presence of God, is burnt to the ground? It causes you probably to question and say, maybe this God isn't real. And once you basically think that and once you don't have this locus of the presence of God that you knew and you don't have the promise of the land all of that has been broken it seems they're in Babylon which is a way of saying they're in a tomb they're dead and so when Isaiah goes on a voice says proclaim I answer what shall I proclaim well this is very good news I guess all flesh is grass <laughs> All flesh is grass, meaning it, it fades and it gets green, it fades. This is the human condition. It's like our grass out here, which is full of rocks and stones and needs some new soil. <laughs> All flesh is grass, but it'll come back because God. And their loyalty like the flower of the field, et cetera, et cetera. And then verse 9, go up onto a high mountain. Who is the prophet talking to? To whom is the prophet talking? Zion, herald of good news. Herald of good news is herald of the gospel. Herald of the evangelion. That's the, that's the word where we get evangelism or evangelization. It's the Greek word for gospel or good news. So it's speaking to the city, which has been in ruins, in tatters, and without a people at least in their mind, and some people were left behind. They were just poor and marginalized and all that. But the city itself is destroyed and in ruins. And so this prophet is saying to the city, get up on the high mountain, which we know to be the Mount of Olives, right next to the city of Jerusalem, if you've ever been there. Get up on the high mountain and do what? Cry out at the top of your voice. Rejoice, basically. Jerusalem, herald of good news. Jerusalem and Zion, the same. Cry out and do not fear. 
Say to the cities of Judah, these outlying areas, here is your God. We see a vision of God. And how do we see that vision? What is God doing? He's coming with power. Remember that word power? Where did we hear that just recently? In Paul. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation, not just of Judah, not just of Jerusalem or Zion, but for all people. That'll be kind of a footnote. Here is his reward with him, his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he feeds his flock. Mark will pick up on the shepherd imagery. Remember when he gets out of the boat and he says, his heart was moved with pity, for these people were like sheep without a shepherd. They didn't understand the power of God. He's carrying them in his bosom and he's leading his youth with care. So what's happening here? What's happening? The people are in Babylon. And what is happening? They, they're in the process of being liberated from death, from the tomb. And so the gospel, before Mark was ever even around, Isaiah gave us the word for gospel right here, evangelion, the gospel, the good news, which is that God will not let his people remain in the tomb. He won't let them remain dead. Even though everything in the world makes it seem like they are dead, they are no longer a people, the promise is no longer being fulfilled, he will not let them remain dead. And so God himself goes to Babylon, the tomb, and releases his people from that bondage and is carrying them back. It's kind of this nice parental image of someone who's rescuing the child. Is this an image of resurrection? Exactly. It's an image of resurrection. So Mark, in many senses, is not entirely original. Jesus is original only in the sense that he is the first one to actually rise from the dead. But the theme of resurrection is already there in the Old Testament. The good news, the new of the good news, is already there in the old. See that? And so this, this little statement that Mark made as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, he's not just referring, I think, to that line about preparing the way in the wilderness, as important as that is. He's saying that this entire gospel that I'm writing is a commentary on this part of Isaiah. Isaiah already spoke the good news. Hopefully we were able to see it. A lot of people weren't. That's just the truth. And we'll see that in the gospel. But if you do, and if you go back and understand what Isaiah was saying, you are going to understand more fully what I'm about to proclaim to you has happened in Jesus Christ. So in a sense, it's a commentary on God's power, which we didn't have to wait for Jesus to understand God's power even a little bit, right? I mean, if you think about the creation of the world, the most powerful thing, something out of nothing, that's amazing. But all of these testaments in the Old Testament of God's power are incredibly powerful. And they become manifest in the most powerful way in Jesus Christ, who rises from the dead. So we're in the first line of Mark's Gospel again. I would propose that, and I'm just copying from my teacher, who gave me a lot of my material. Um, I would propose that it should read, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, period. Does that make sense? Because it's a commentary. And so Mark is setting us up. Now, the beginning of the gospel. Why is it the beginning? It sounds like a dumb question. I guess it kind of is, but it's a trick question. <laughs> yeah, because it's not the ending. So <laughs> it's the first, the first words, right? Where have we heard the beginning before? John, who is echoing Genesis, in the beginning. The book, Bereshit, in the beginning. That's what it's called in Hebrew. Or in Greek, it's called Genesis, which is a beginning. So it's the beginning, not only because it stands as the first part of Mark's gospel, but because the entire gospel is a beginning. This goes back to what we were saying about reading. So we don't just read the gospels to say that we're pious and holy. 
we always read the gospel for the sake of actually putting it into practice. And so the beginning is understanding what the gospel really is. Understanding that we don't have to be violent or return uh, a slap for a slap, a punch for a punch. We don't have to cut people down to have the fullness of life. That's the beginning that shows us, it lays the groundwork. And then the next phase is us actually living it or the church living it and then handing it on to us so that we can create that new beginning or have it created for us and live it. It's also something that's interesting. Let's turn to the end of the Gospel of Mark. So Mark chapter 16. Now this is where things get kind of interesting and complicated. You thought Mark's Gospel was this easy Gospel because it's only 16 chapters. And then you get to the ending and you don't know what to choose. Do you have headings? At the ending there? What do, what do they say? The resurrection of Jesus. Okay, that's... Ah, then there's the longer ending, and then there's the shorter ending. So it's kind of like pick your ending, uh, your ad lib kind of thing, or mad lib or whatever. So, what's going on here? What's going on here? Well, first of all, if we keep in mind that this is all, all 16 chapters are the beginning of the gospel, and this is not the end, really, of the gospel. It's just pushing us out to proclaim and live the gospel. We think that Mark ended his gospel at verse 8. Now, where does verse 8 fall? Right before the longer ending. <laughs> How does verse 8 read? Then they went out and fled from the tomb, seized with trembling and bewilderment. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Sound like good news? <laughs> not so much. And it bothered people so much that they thought this is not possible, that the gospel ended this way. But if we keep in mind that Mark is writing a beginning to the gospel and trying to get us to be the ones to hand that on, we don't need a longer ending or a shorter ending. Those are probably copied from different traditions, perhaps another version of the gospel. And they attempt to deal with this question mark, this radical question mark at the end of the gospel that says, will you be a disciple and go and reread re or re-understand what Jesus has said? So we find ourselves bewildered and amazed. Imagine if you were the one to see your teacher, dead, and then no longer there in the tomb. Imagine the question mark that it would leave for you. Imagine the question mark that it left for the people in Babylon. Again, where is God? What kind of God is this? Where is the promise? Have we been duped? Big question mark. And God lets us sit with question marks. He's given us the coronavirus. A big question mark on how we relate to one another as human beings. How we live in a time of initial crisis and then ongoing kind of pandemic. There are big question marks all over life. The question is how we will respond to them. And so Mark's gospel, we can contend, was written so that you get to that ending and are not satisfied. You're not satisfied with that ending. And what, what happens when you, um, gosh, what, mo what movie was it? Uh, was it 2001, A Space Odyssey? I was watching one time, and I thought the DVD like skipped or something. And that's easy in like a Kubrick movie to, to think that. But I got to the end, and I thought, I definitely missed something, right? And what, what do you do? You re yeah, back in the day, you rewind <laughs> in DVDs. You kind of scrub and go back. And I, I thought, well, I, I definitely missed something. You have to go back. It's the genius of Kubrick to make us have to go back which is, in a sense, echoing the genius of Mark, who makes us go back to the very beginning, his beginning. And we have to read it again, and we see things, hopefully, that we didn't see the first time. We see, from the very first chapter, Elijah. He's not called Elijah here yet, explicitly. He's called Elijah later. We also don't see the risen Jesus in this gospel, do we? They're at the empty tomb. But where do we see the risen Jesus if we read it again? Remember on the mountain with Elijah and Moses? 
Mark chapter 9, I believe. What happens on the mountain? The transfiguration, which is already a hint. It's already a kind of foreshadowing. Maybe literary, uh, literarily, Mark is setting us up to understand that big question mark at the end. But we have to go back, rewind, and rewatch with new eyes once we see it. See how it demands kind of our attention, it demands our relationship. It's not just something that we can memorize, it's something that we have to engage in. That's what's so unique about the gospel genre. It demands that you live it. You can read a mystery novel, you don't have to, re you don't have to live a mystery novel. You can read the Wall Street Journal, you don't have to live the Wall Street Journal. This is what is completely other about the gospel. It demands that you put it into practice. Okay? So we've gotten really far so far. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, we did bookends. Maybe we'll do that every time and just kind of meet, meet in the middle. <laughs> but are you satisfied? <laughs> I hope not because there's so much more. So what does it say at the, at the beginning again? The beginning of the gospel of God. Gospel. We already saw one instance of the word gospel in the Old Testament in Isaiah. Another instance, we won't turn there, but I think it's in the handout that I'll send to you all. Another instance is not good news. It's the news of a battle victory. So it's good news in the sense that you may have won the battle. Overall, you can say probably not good news. But there are two instances, um, especially in the, excuse me, the first book of Samuel and the second book of Samuel. And the word, the same word is used there, evangelion, gospel, ev um, evangelization, evangelical, gospel. It's used there to report that the battle has been won. And one of those instances, you remember Absalom, Absalom, King David's son, who has been killed, and the people think that they're bringing good news to David. And how does David react? Absol yeah, he's, he's upset. He's upset. My Absalom is dead. Even though he was kind of acting like an enemy, he, David is upset. So it's not really good news, but the whole point is that it's news of a battle. It's the outcome of a battle. So how does that actually play into the Gospel of Mark? Well, we're going to see very shortly that Jesus enters right into, where does he go? Right after John the Baptist? After he's baptized, he's rushed right into Uh, before the public life, the temptation in the wilderness. The temptation in the wilderness, yeah. So we're going to see Mark has this theme of combat, of battle. Obviously, Jesus' way of battling is completely other than yielding a sword, wielding a sword, or, or any sort of violent means. He's completely disarming that use of violence because he's taking it upon himself. But... It's another kind of shade of meaning, if you will, of, of gospel. Okay? And then, these two other titles, Christ and the, the square brackets. What in the world are these square, <laughs> square brackets for? First of all, what is Christ? No. Christ, the, Christ what does Christ mean? It means what? No, no, Jesus means Savior. He will save us from our sins. Christ. So if you go to the census, the Census Bureau in the Old World, and look up the last name Christ, will you find Jesus? No, no. It, Jesus is the Christ. It's a title that kind of eventually made its way as if it were a last name, but it's not a last name. He wasn't son of Mary Christ or Joseph Christ. He was Jesus, the Christ. And the Christ, the word Christ, Christ comes from the Greek, Christos, which is translating, see if you hear the other word that it could be. In Hebrew, it's Mashiach. Mashiach. What is that in, in English? No. Messiah. Messiah. So the Messiah. Now, 
it means, what does, <laughs> what does Mashiach mean? What does Messiah mean? <laughs> We're just going in circles. It means the anointed one. The anointed one. Now, it might scandal us, scandalize us to realize that there's more than one anointed one in the Old Testament. Who is anointed in the Old Testament? David. David so he's a king. The kings. Solomon. The kings. And who else? There you go, the prophets, some, some of the prophets. One especially, that if we were at daily mass last Monday, was it? When Jesus is in the synagogue and he reads from the prophet, and he says, the Spirit of God is upon me. He has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He's reading from a scroll. This is in the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> we just want to confuse you as much as possible the first day. And he's reading from a scroll. And what, what scroll is that? The prophet... Isaiah, other instance of good news. So Isaiah, the prophet, being anointed to share the good news. And also, what about the third figure that's anointed? Think about your baptism. You already mentioned king, prophet, the third, priest. The priest is anointed. If you were to read through Leviticus, um, you'll see the ceremony of anointing for a priest. Okay? Leviticus chapter 4. Now, there's also this idea that develops over time that the Messiah is coming in the end of days. If you read through the book of Daniel, which is kind of psychedelic at some points. Um, apocalyptic might be the more professional term. <laughs> but Daniel is, is showing us the vision of the Son of Man, who is... Um, receiving authority, receiving power. There's this concept that the Messiah would be like that at the end of days. Now, there's also one very scandalous instance of Messiah, and that is also in the book of Isaiah. We don't have to flip there, but it's not a priest, a prophet, or a king. Well, kind of a king, but not an Israelite king. It's the person who frees the people from Babylon. He's a Persian. His name is Cyrus. Cyrus the Persian, who is called, interestingly enough, my Messiah. God is saying that. Listen to my Messiah, because he's freeing you from the tomb. So very interesting. It's got a number of different dimensions of meaning, or shades of meaning, in the Old Testament. Now, we have to understand what Mark is doing with it. So Mark is saying, he's kind of carrying this baggage and packing it tightly into this one word, and he's saying that this is Jesus. He's letting us know from the very first sentence that Jesus is the one to fulfill the expectations of the Messiah. Now, what those expectations really are, we'll see. Because he's not coming to conquer in the ordinary sense. He's coming to conquer conquering, we might be able to say, and free us from our sins. He's also called the Son of God, though. And tell me something about the Son of God. Who is the Son of God? Besides Jesus. Besides Jesus. We, yeah, so we are sons and daughters of God by participation in Jesus. But I'm thinking biblically. If we go back to the Old Testament, there are a few instances of someone who's not Jesus being called the Son of God. Very important for us to realize so that we're not fundamentalists and we're not kind of narrow, narrowly looking at terms and saying, oh, well, Jesus is the only Son of God. Well, no, if we believe <laughs> in the testimony of the Bible, that's not true. The first Son of God, who? Adam. Adam is the first Son of God. Why is he the first Son of God? Well, to be a son of a father, the father does what that makes him a father in the Bible? He creates something a little bit more, though. He names him. He names him. He names him. The father names, which is picked up in Zechariah in Luke's Gospel. Remember, he's, he's struck mute 
and they're trying to name him something else. And he said, no, John is his name. A very fatherly role, at least in the mind of the Bible. Mothers can name their children today too. We don't want to <laughs> exclude that, obviously. But in the mind of the Bible, in how they're laying it out, the father names. And so the one who is named is son of the father. So Adam is son of God. And Luke, by the way, picks that up. Remember Matthew's genealogy? It starts with um, Abraham, goes down through David, and then to Jesus. What's different about Luke's genealogy? It goes the reverse. It starts with Jesus, and it works it way up, its way up. So instead of so-and-so begat or was the father of, it's so-and-so was the son of, the son of, the son of, the son of a son of a sailor, like Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> but it goes up instead of down. And who's the last person on that line in Luke's gospel? They're not the same genealogies, by the way. So I hope, I'm hoping you weren't expecting them to be exactly the same. They're not. It is Adam. And Adam is called there, son of God. So even in the New Testament, Adam is viewed as the son of God. So that's one instance, Adam. That's an important instance. Who's next? Who's the next one that's called son? This one is, is a little bit harder. Not Abraham. So Moses is at the mountain. Remember the burning bush? And the burning bush is talking to him, and it's, we know it's the presence of God. And God says, go, get my firstborn son. And what is that a mission to? To go back to Egypt and release who? The people. Israelites, they will become Israelites when they become Israel, but um, they're Hebrews there, we might be able to say. They're being born. So the passage through the Red Sea is, is like a birth through blood and water. That's how births happen. Well, at least in the, in the mind of the Bible again, they're being birthed into existence. It's like they're in the womb in Israel. They're in the womb. They, they exist, but they're not really yet revealed to the world as son of God. So they're being born, and Moses takes them back to Sinai. That's where they received the law or the Torah, the instruction. It, it shows up later, by the way. It's not just in Exodus, but Hosea, um, Hosea chapter 11 will say, um, out of Egypt I called my son, which we should recognize, not necessarily because we spend all this time reading Hosea, although I would highly recommend it, great prophet. But we read, especially around the time of Christmas, from Matthew's Gospel. And Matthew is using these Old Testament things to say, this is the fulfillment. And one of those things is Hosea 11, where Jesus is, had to go down to Egypt. Why? Get away from Herod, who was going to kill the family, uh, the slaughter of the innocents. So he goes down to Egypt. And then, from Egypt, he's led out of Egypt once Herod is, is dead. And that's where Matthew says this kind of majestic line, Out of Egypt I called my son. So he's applying the son to Jesus. And in a sense, he's saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel. He's the fulfillment of their expectations. He is the new Israel, the fuller, excuse me, Israel. Okay? So, the people of Israel, Adam, also the king. The kings in the Old Testament can be referred to as sons of God. Sometimes angels, even, in the Old Testament, the sons of God. It's like the ones who are, at least in the mind of the Bible, again, we don't necessarily have to believe it's like this today, but um, the angels kind of surrounding God in the heavenly court, they are sometimes called sons of God because they're kind of right there. And then finally, you don't have to remember all of this. I'm just throwing a lot at you, obviously. The most important ones are Adam and Israel and maybe the king. But the Roman, Empire, or Roman emperor as well. 
Caesar had called himself son of God. If you have a coin from the Roman emperor, you can look online, and it says Caesar Augustus Fili, uh, what's the word, Dei, so son of God. He kind of put that on himself, obviously. <laughs> he wants everyone to believe that he is somewhat divine so that he can rule them. We'll see that it's the other way around with Jesus. He is divine, and so he can rule them. Okay? Good so far. So we already mentioned that the, these Old Testament citations, Behold, I'm sending my messenger, a voice crying in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. This is a conglomeration of texts. Uh, Mark is making kind of like a stew of the, these Old Testament texts. So we said Malachi, we said Isaiah, a little bit of Exodus too. I'm sending my messenger um, ahead of you is also reckoning, or, uh, hearkening back to when they're in the desert and God says, I'm going to send my angel before you to, to show you the way. So this is, this is setting us up completely to understand this gospel as an exodus from the tomb or from Babylon, all of these themes are kind of being put together in a nice souffle. Make straight his path. So God is working yet again. Okay? So he's weaving together the Old Testament. Now, this is an explicit citation. He's at least telling us that he's citing the Old Testament. But you see already that Mark is kind of deft. He's, he's very clever in how he puts these things together. And he's also hiding a little bit too, because if he just says Isaiah, well, he knows that it's not just Isaiah. But again, this whole thing is much like Isaiah. Now what, what though about John the Baptist? So people in the whole of the Judean countryside and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized him in the Jordan by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. Verse 6 says what? John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he fed on locusts. He sounds like a, a, a hipster. I, I always picture him with like this giant leather belt and kind of these <laughs> cool clothes that people probably want to wear today, but um, were penitential back then. <laughs> so he, but who wore that? Anyone? Does that sound familiar at all? This is where, again, we, Mark is just assuming that we know the Old Testament, which for him was just the scriptures, but... Um, you know, when they don't have many books around to read or Netflix or anything like that, it's easier to know your faith because you've got all these scrolls and that's it. And you're taught that. There's a figure, though. Yes, Elijah. Perfect. Elijah. Elijah's the one who is dressed in this weird way and he's eating weird things. He's this weird prophet who is kind of intimidating to people because he's so weird. Um, and Elijah, it says, I think it's at the very beginning of the second book of Kings, the very beginning, they're looking for, for Elijah. 2 Kings 1, yeah. And he is going out. Uh, the, the king's attendants are going out because they're trying to find him. And they said, we don't know if we found him. And they take word back to the king. And the king says, how is he dressed? They said, well, he's dressed with a leather belt and camel's hair, right? And the king knows immediately, that's Elijah. That's Elijah. So we have to be like the king and hear that and say, that's Elijah. Now see, if we're reading through the Gospel of Mark and we eventually get to that chapter that Jesus says, that was Elijah, now we see it. How did we miss it this first time? How did we miss it? Because if we had picked up on those clues, the way he's dressed, dressed exactly as Elijah, but it slips our attention because we're not paying attention. And so this is an exercise many times in just getting us to, <laughs> to wake up and really care about the details because they're packing a, a lot in there. Okay. 
Um, just one interesting thing, another interesting thing about this. So he's being baptized. Where have we been baptized before? Is this the first mention of baptism in the Bible? Where is he baptizing? The Jordan. Where have we heard the Jordan before? This is, this is tough, so I'm just kind of asking to get our minds moving a little bit. But mm, Close. Yeah, yeah, close. So the people are led out of Egypt. They're wandering through the desert and into, into the promised land. Remember, they have to cross in the book of Joshua, Yeshua, or in Greek, Jesus. Does that sound familiar? Jesus would be Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, we've already met Jesus in the Old Testament in the form of Joshua. That's his Hebrew name, Joshua. His Greek name is Jesus, which, which is the one that gives us our English name. But we've met him in the book of Joshua. And in Joshua, what's happening in the book of Joshua? Well, we've just been given the law. And we've been wandering through the desert. And now Joshua is that definitive moment. There's no more Moses. Moses died. He didn't enter the land. Joshua is responsible for, for what? Before the battle of Jericho. Yeah, just in general. Where is he leading them? Into the promised land. Yeah. So do we see the correspondence now between Jesus here? He's not just getting us a parcel of land, he is the one that's leading us into the definitive fulfillment of the promise, which is not just a garden here. It's being resurrected from the dead, living a life that lasts forever. And so Jesus, this new Joshua, this new Jesus, um, Mark is already sending us back to that book. And he's saying that with what John is doing. He's baptizing because there is a baptism that happens in the, in the book of Joshua. What is that baptism? Well, the priests are walking through the river. And that river is the Jordan. And it says, very explicitly, their feet are baptized. The river kind of splits, like the, the Red Sea, the Reed Sea, before it, a common theme. And they're walking through and their feet are baptized. They are entering into the land. They are leaving behind the life of slavery and death. And they're entering into the promise. And so what John is doing here is preparing us for that. All of this symbolism is getting us to realize that this is the, the promise. It's a baptism of repentance. So re turn around if you're, <laughs> if you're oriented toward Egypt or to death to sin, turn around and come to life. Come to uh, the fulfillment of the promise. Come to the waters. And of course, this happens. They baptize. And what happens? One mightier than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop and lo loosen the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Good. So we've heard that enough. And then he actually does. So he baptizes Jesus. It happened in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Who else came from Nazareth of Galilee in the Old Testament? You can't think of anybody? Which is good, because no one did. <laughs> it was n never, <laughs> I know. It was never once mentioned in the Old Testament. Never once. This is a nothing city. A nothing town. Nazareth never once. Which makes it problematic that Jesus came from there. What good can come of Nazareth? That's the mentality. These backwards bumpkins, basically, in Galilee. And then Nazareth, of all places. There's nothing that the prophets speak about Nazareth. Nothing that they're expecting from Nazareth. What does that say, though, about God? Mm 
Mm -hmm. We can say maybe that the fact that he is coming from Nazareth, a no-name place, is testifying still, even though the prophets didn't say it explicitly, is getting at what the prophets did say. That God can always bring new out of chaos or out of nothingness. And think about how we think that the world was created, the universe was created. It was created, we say, out of nothing. This is the God who, is, who was creator out of nothing, and especially in something like Nazareth, which is a nothing. What's the other nothing in, in the gospel? Not a place, but a thing. Uh, well, he, and, and Mark doesn't mention it, so sort of in Nazareth. So actually, people were so scandalized by the fact that he was born, perhaps, in Nazareth, or he was from Nazareth, that the tradition arose that he was, he had to fulfill the prophet Micah's expectation that the Messiah would be born in, in what city? Bethlehem. Was he born in Bethlehem for sure? Mark doesn't say it. And John, if you read John's gospel, it doesn't seem like he thinks that Jesus was born in Bethlehem either. He's from Nazareth. What's that? You, I know, you kissed the star at the manger. What did you kiss? <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not here to say that it's absolutely true that he was born outside of Bethlehem or that he was. Those are different level questions. But certainly Matthew and Luke put him in Bethlehem, maybe for the reason of fulfilling that expectation that he'd be born in Bethlehem. Maybe because they're so scandalized that they think that the Messiah is from Nazareth. There's no <laughs> evidence of that whatsoever in the Old Testament. But the other nothing I'm thinking of in the Gospel is the central one toward the end, which is the cross. The word cross, the Greek word staros, never appears in the Old Testament. So we're thinking, here are two poles, really, Nazareth, the cross, and death itself, which is really nothingness. That God is shedding his light and actually bringing something out of nothing. Make sense? Total sense? Any questions? No questions? <laughs> I'm trying to destroy your Christmases, the Grinch. <laughs> I'll repeat it for the people at home, actually. So Sister Joanna is levying a charge against all Jesuits and saying that they're trying to take everything out of Christmas, <laughs> everything good out of Christmas. Yeah, I will be. I love the Jesuits. You know, I know. Yeah. So she's saying that the Pope wrote to the Jesuits saying, whatever you do, don't take Christ out of Christmas. So I think everyone, even the Jesuits, can get behind, right? But that's, it, it's an interesting thing that we we can delve into more in later sessions or different sessions or series, but even reading things like the, the infancy narratives in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, we have to take them with a grain of historical salt. So we see that they're trying to construct something theologically. They're not trying to report history as it happened, like if it were videotaped. Did it happen? It, it could have. I, I mean, we can't say definitively that it didn't, but we've already seen in Mark's Gospel that Mark is throwing together these Old Testament streams, and he's making them one for his purpose. He is trying to explain the resurrection, or at least testify to the resurrection. Matthew and Luke are going to do it in their own way, with their own kind of perspective, and that will be one where they take in these traditions, the kings, well, Isaiah says that the kings will load up their, their caravans and they will come to the holy city. 
and they will prostrate, or they will finally see the Lord. All the nations of the earth are coming to the, the Lord. That's what Matthew is, is saying. Here's the Lord. The nations are coming. It's symbolic. Could they have come? Sure. But are they coming in a deeper way? Yes, as the church gathers them in around the Lord. That's our job. So um, a lot of that, we have to be more measured or a, li a little bit more balanced sometimes in, in our appreciation of what the gospel writers are doing. We don't want to be fundamentalists. Where it, says, it says it right here, I must believe it. Well, there are different degrees of, <laughs> of truth or interpretation of these things. So our hope is that as we continue to do this, that'll be just second nature where we can critically critically like critically thinking, look at a text and appreciate it for the beauty that it, that it really is and how much it gives us. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for coming in person and thank you all who I'm hoping are seeing me right now and I'm hoping I don't have a bunch of emails saying that I wasn't seen, but uh, thank you all for joining us and I'm glad to be offering this and so your feedback is always appreciated and welcomed. Um, if it's too much, too little, whatever. Um, but I'm, I'm really glad to be offering it, and, and thanks for your participation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Hallelujah.